Good morning, CLC. I invite everyone now to just take in a nice deep breath, breathing in the love and light that is life itself. And as you breathe out, let go of anything that no longer serves you. Take in another nice, deep, cleansing breath, breathing in life, breathing in love. And as you release this breath, allow your body to just relax in this moment. And allow your mind to be here, now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin this inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your hand and let my words act as your own. For your own inner healing, acceptance and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it and it is in the midst of me. Sensitive and responsive to my every thought word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. I acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of this infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. Visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass, 
In seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled and gratefully speak these words. I accept. I accept. Knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This can be a friend, a family member, a teacher or mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room this morning. I call upon this divine inflow and state out loud, I am grateful for the good in your life. I am grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in the room or virtually on this broadcast and share in confidence and gratitude and saying, I'm grateful for the good in your lives. Well, in case you're wondering where Reverend Jesse is, you know, the theory is that he did not want to put himself up to a lot of abuse from me with puns. So. <laughs> but the real truth is that, you know, Jesse works, Reverend Jesse works seven days a week, and I think he's earned at least one day off. You know, I was actually needing a tissue, and I was going to pick up one by Danielle there, and then I saw they were fabric stuff, and so I thought, gee, I better not use those. <laughs> yeah, well, there you are then. Okay, so if you remember nothing else about this talk this morning, remember three things. Why well, actually four? Because I'm going to start with a joke. What do they call a cow that has just given birth? Decaffeinated. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Is there anybody else in the is there anybody in the room who is relatively new to science of mind teaching? Okay, cool. Mark. Good. At least my talk will not be in vain. So if you remember nothing else, remember three things about this talk. Hi sir, I'm gonna start going back to the song that Mel and Mel just sang, you know, which is There is no place where God is not. And that really kind of sums up our teaching in a nutshell. So as always, whether you realize it or not, we're always going back to basic science of mind teaching when, when we talk up here. But whatever we're actually talking about, it's actually really going back to basic science of mind teaching. So the first thing to remember is thought. The second thing is feeling. And then the, the third thing beyond that is awareness. And of those three, probably the most important is awareness. So my, my talk today is going to kind of concern all those three. I didn't write my talk out. I got some pointers here in case I forget to, to go where I am. When I was preparing for this talk, I, for some wacky reason, a, a Bible passage came in my head. And it's one I really didn't like as a kid because it was kind of scary. So I was trying to think, why would he come in here? I'd already given Jesse the title of the talk, which was Mind the Gap. I thought, why did this particular passage come in my mind? I couldn't think about it. And then it dawned on me. A couple of things dawned on me. When I was a kid, I was taught what was kind of a literal interpretation of the Bible. Well, as I'll let you know in a minute, that's impossible. But first of all, the Bible passages, and I'm going to explain it in metaphysical terms. You know, when Reverend Lisa and I were in ministerial school, and probably 
Reverend Marcia and Reverend Jesse before us. We took something called Metaphysical Bible. Right, Lisa? And in there, we were given Bible passages, or we could pick a Bible passage, and we had to give it a metaphysical interpretation as opposed to the original one that I learned as a kid and probably a lot of you learned as kids, which was more literal. This is why I like hands-free mics. You can actually mess around here more. I promise you this is the only thing I'm going to read to you today. So I'm not going to pull a book out. I'm not going to start reading. This is the only thing I'm going to read to you today. It is a little bit long, and that's really the only thing I've written out for this talk, apart from a few headings. It's from the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 16, and it's verses 19 through 21. And it's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. I don't actually think it's the same. It can't be the same Lazarus who was raised from the dead because it just doesn't fit the picture. So Lazarus, I guess, was a popular name in those days. There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. That wasn't me. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and from the netherworld, read hell, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he's comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between you and us, a great chasm is established that prevent, prevents anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from yours to ours. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I've got five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. He said, Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to tell them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. So the part of that that caught my attention was the fact that Abraham says to him that, I'm going to reread it. Here we are. Moreover, between you and us, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or vice versa. <coughs> and in some, some interpretations, it says there's a chasm that no man can help cross. So I was thinking about this, and I thought, well, how could that be interpreted in metaphysical terms? Well, first of all, when I was a kid, I was taught that heaven was a real place. And hell was a real place. And when I came into Science of Mind teaching, I came to realize, and actually a recent pub said the same thing as well, that heaven and hell are states of mind. So Abraham is in heaven because why? His state of mind allows him to be in heaven. The rich man who died and is, quote, tormented, unquote, was in hell, or purgatory or whatever because his state of mind was holding him there so this is how I would interpret these passages that we don't take the Bible literally you cannot take the Bible literally I know a lot of people claim they can you can't, it's impossible for instance if you look at the creation story or creation myth we would say and by the way myth doesn't mean to say it's not true. 
it just means to say it may not be literally true, but there is a truth behind. A myth is something that's got a truth, but it's not to be taken literally. So if you look at the first book of the Bible, Genesis, you'll see that there's two creation stories. Which one do you want to pick? A friend of ours was over arguing with us one day, right, Barbara? Mary? And she said, no, there's no, there's just one creation story. I said, well, Mary, you need to go back and read Genesis again because there's actually two creation stories. Oh, and by the way, while you're at it, why don't you do this? In the Bible, it clearly states that God is male and female. No, it doesn't. I said, yes, it does. Let us create man in our image, male and female. It's clear there, Mary. So you cannot interpret the Bible literally. It's just impossible. And a lot of it's metaphor as well. If you want to read a couple of good books about looking at the Bible again in a different light, and this is probably going to get quoted in the, in the chat here. Oh, and by the way, for the ones of you who are always in the room, and for the ones of you online go online know this, between Reverend... Lisa and Danielle, they're always putting comments in the chat. So whatever, when a Jesse says something, makes a quote, they'll actually go research it and they'll put the information in there. And you can actually get this right. When you go to our Facebook Live page, if you watch the service there afterwards, you'll see that all these comments, in, and there's a lot of really useful stuff in there. So go check it out. Of course, that means I've forgotten where I was right now. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, there's two creation stories, yeah. So, so the first one, I recommend. It's a really good book, and some of you have been in classes know it. It's called Reading the Bible Again for the First Time. It's by Marcus Borg. It's a really good book. Marcus Borg. He was a, he was a Christian minister of some kind. I forgot which, which sort it was. So Reading the Bible Again for the First Time. And also... There's, I think it's called The Hidden Truth of the Bible, or something like that from uh, Ernest Holmes. So there's an Ernest Holmes book on that as well. So one, when I went back to look at this um, Bible story again, I saw that there was this chasm. And I thought, well, I could probably use that as a metaphor for actually helping explain a lot of science of mind stuff. Why? Because oftentimes the chasm is in our minds. The chasm exists in our minds. It doesn't exist in reality. It's actually existing in our minds. So what's the chasm? Often it's between where we are now and where we want to be, or what we have now and we want to have. And of course, the beauty of science of mind is it teaches us how to get beyond these things. I always remember the story, and I forget which Indiana Jones movie it was, and somebody's going to shout out and let me know, right? Because, oh, the big difference between the Catholic Church and here is that nobody, nobody would shout out. They would all be quiet during the sermon or homily, whichever it was. Nobody would say a word, and if anybody even coughed, they were looked at, you know, with what are you doing? Why are you coughing? The priest is talking, but the deacon's talking. Shut up. That's the first thing I remember coming here. People were shouting out back and forth. You know, Ruth especially would be shouting back and forth to Jesse. I thought, my God, you can't do that in a church. That's impossible, you know. Anyway, they did. So, so the, the movie was about Indiana Jones. He's being chased by this big boulder, and then he comes to this chasm, and he's got two choices. It can either get mowed down. Wh which movie was it? Does anybody remember? The first one. Okay. It wasn't Indiana Jones or The Rock. I know that one. What was that? Anyway. So, Red is the Lost Ark. Okay. So when he gets, to the, <clears throat> he gets to this chasm, and he has two choices. He can either get mowed down, or he can step out into this chasm. So he chooses to step out into the chasm in faith because he figures out in his head, I guess, real quickly, that <clears throat> since there's a way to get to the prize, that something's got to happen. So he, you all know as he steps out, the bridge appears. So what he's done is he's actually moved forward in faith. He's gone forward in faith. He's put his faith in the fact that he knows something's going to happen. 
So all the time in life, we put our faith in lots of different things. You know, we put our faith in the fact that the sun is going to come up and go down. You know, to the Egyptians, this was a big deal. Ra actually came up in the morning, and it was a young person. And as it went across the sky and set, set at night, Ra became an old man. And then during the night, Ra revitalized himself and came back again and did the circle again. So these things have always been important. So the, the, the big thing that we, we teach in Science of Mind is this. It, it's faith. And what, what, is, what is faith or belief? What is belief? Belief is thought plus feeling. Belief is thought plus feeling. So I remember, actually, before I came to Science of Mind, when I was with, you remember I was with Bob Proctor. Bob Proctor was my first mentor. He died, he died last year, I think, actually. I didn't realize that he was teaching new thought under some other guys, under things like the science of getting rich. So he was actually teaching new thought. And he, he was one of the first ones where I heard the expression, thought plus feeling equals belief. That when you put these two things together, something magical happens and things begin to appear. So that was this one of the basic premises of science of mind teaching, thought plus feeling. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I used to really look forward to Christmas. And I had this great belief that magically Father Christmas, a.k.a. Santa Claus here, would produce all these goodies under the Christmas tree. And even though my mother didn't have much money, somehow she managed to scrape together. And she'd been listening. I didn't know, of course. She'd been listening to what I'd been saying in November and December and had figured out what I wanted, you know. But when this stuff magically appeared there, he... Fantastic. So you could say in a way that my belief in the in these soldiers and these forts and whatever it was appearing was was actually what produced this. And to some extent that's true. I was trying to think of a really good way to create an analogy to to explain the gap in thought plus feeling. My title today was called Mind the Gap. Why is it called Mind the Gap? Because when I was thinking about chasm, I started thinking about the first time I went to London as a teenager, and I got on the subway there. It's called the Tube. Not the Tube, it's the Tube. If you get it wrong, they will correct you. So who's been to London? Who's been on the Tube? As a kid, the first thing I remember was I was standing on the platform, and there's this disembodied voice saying, Mind the gap. <laughs> I'm looking, at, looking around. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. What on earth is the gap? Well, of course, the gap, in the previous generation of trains, the gap was actually, of course, the gap between the train and the platform. So I guess CYA, right, they're telling you, mind the gap. So I minded the gap. But then I thought, this is a, actually a, a good metaphor for explaining or reinforcing, really, because most of you are familiar with the science of mind, for reinforcing some of our principles. Because oftentimes, the gap between what we want or what we would like is the gap between our thoughts and our feelings. You know, sometimes I'll want something and I'll decide to do some treatment and I can't get into that feeling. I, I know what it is I want, but I can't always get into that feeling of it. So I substitute. I'll imagine when it, we've got a little cat called, well, actually, she's not a little cat, she's a heavy cat. <laughs> called Elfie. Why is she called Elfie? Because when she was a kitten, 
She was really tiny, but she had these huge ears. And I thought, my God, she looks just like an elf. So we called her Elfie. But she's got this habit, and Lisa's got cats, and probably some of the rest of you do. And she will sit on your lap. She'll look up into your eyes adoringly, and it just melts your heart. So if I really need to get into some good feelings, guess what? I imagine Elfie sat on my lap looking up at me, and it really just brings great feelings to me. So I apply this to what it is I'm trying to achieve. So going back to the train analogy, so I thought, well, how can I use this whole thing as a metaphor for spiritual mind training? And I thought, well, London has a, a transportation system, and it includes essentially the tube, but it also includes the buses. Um, for the sake of argument, let's say it includes the, the taxi cabs as well. Oh, and by the way, if you've not been to London recently, I used to imagine London, well, I've been there a lot. There's, the taxi cabs were these black vehicles who were quite tall, right? The ones of you have seen them, they were really tall, and they, they were really unique. Well, when I was there two years ago, guess what? They're not black anymore. They are multicolored. They've got all these ads on them. They're phenomenal colors. They're, they're really painted extraordinarily well. And, and also a lot of them are EVs now, so there's no smoke emissions coming out of there. That's kind of beside the point in the whole story. But, <laughs> but there you are then. I, you know, Jesse gets sidetracked, right? Yes, he does. Yeah. I can, I can get sidetracked as well. Is that okay? Yeah. I'd probably get five out of ten if this was in ministerial school. But anyway, we, by the way, we had this really strict teacher, right? right? The boss, who was the then boss, Mile High, yeah. See? He, he was... He was he's a killer. Anyway, so more about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do get sidetracked occasionally. No, I get sidetracked a lot. And um, so I thought, how can I use this as an analogy? And I thought, well, let's imagine the, the transportation system is the law. And let's imagine that the train is is your feelings. Now let's imagine that the thoughts are you stood on the platform. So when, when you are on the platform, you know what you want. You know where you want to go. So I'm going to give you an example. Two years ago, I was staying in Holland, and we all decided to, no, a year ago, a year ago, sorry. We're in Holland. We decided that we were going to go to to England, we had booked actually a bed and breakfast. We're going to go to England for, I think it was four days. Uh, the easiest way to get there was on Eurostar. Uh, Eurostar is the train that goes under the Channel Tunnel. It's actually the longest tunnel in the world. A vehicle, a vehicle of any sort of tunnel. It's a train tunnel. Uh, any of you been on it? You've been on it. Put your hand up. It's like in class, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, so we took the Eurostar, and it comes into a, a huge station called King's Cross and Pancras. It's got two sections to it. It's got a, the national section. It's got the international section. So when you come in on Eurostar, you come into the international section. And it's, it's also got attached to it um, the underground, you know, the tube. So I was thinking, so what would you, if you wanted to get to the Tower of London, on your visit to London. And a lot of people do. Why, I don't know, because it's a horrible place. And it costs a fortune. You know, we were going to go in, and then we saw how much it was, and we thought, well, we can observe it from the outside. I did to which I had been in it years ago, so I knew what was in there anyway. So saying you want to get from King's Cross St. Pancras, you want to go to the Tower of London. And the, the stop on the subway is actually called Tower Bridge. There's 
a bunch of different ways you can go. You could, you could get a cab, but you really want to do that in any huge city, especially you know during the day. You could get a bus, but that's probably even worse. Why? It's cheaper, but why is it worse? Because not only is it going to contend with all this traffic, yeah, they have bus lines, to, but even so, it's got to make God knows how many stops before it gets to the tower. You may have to change two or three times. Who knows? You could cycle there, but I wouldn't recommend that in London traffic. <laughs> or you could walk there, and then you will get there tomorrow. <laughs> so the fastest way to get there is on the tube. So you're on the platform, and this idea is in your mind. You want to get to the Tower of London. Stepping over the gap, minding the gap, crossing the chasm, getting across the gap, is you adding your feelings to your thoughts. So when you get on the train, the train actually is you plus your thoughts and feelings, it's your belief. And it's your belief that will provide the impetus, the train, to take you to the station. And what, what is actually moving the train, of course, is the law. And if you don't get on and off in between, you will get there pretty quickly. Just like in your thoughts, if you don't get diverted too much in your thoughts, you don't get disconnected from your thoughts and your feelings, <coughs> And by the same token, you'll get there a lot faster. So I decided to use this as an analogy. And I wanted to flip this back to spiritual mind treatment because spiritual mind treatment, and I know you hear this all the time, but it's great to be reminded. And it's great for me to be reminded. Spiritual mind treatment is an incredible tool. You know, when I was growing up as a kid, I was taught one form of prayer. And that form of prayer was asking. Actually, a lot of the time, it was begging. It was pleading. And I'm sure you've all been there, right? Hey, God. Well, actually, Jesus, or Lord. Hey, if you'll do this for me, I won't eat candy for a week. <laughs> I really need that bicycle. And I know you can provide it, but I promise you, I will not touch any candy, actually toffee in England, for a whole week. How about that if you'll give it to me? So that's kind of pleading and begging prayer. Negotiating. But negotiating, right, exactly. Exactly, Lisa. It's negotiating. And how many of you have not negotiated with God to get something? I don't see any hands going up in the room here. <laughs> <laughs> but I have met I've done it so when I when I when I came into New Thought the idea of prayer was this well not always pleading and begging but sometimes asking okay so the inference is here that somebody has something that you want and they have the power to give it to you but to withhold it from you right like if you get, if you, for instance, you know, a lot of the teaching is if you good, live a good life, you're going to go to heaven. If you got a good life, good things are going to happen in your life. But of course, in science of mind, we don't look at it that way. We look at it differently. We look at the fact that there's just one thing that brings everything into existence. I choose to call it God. If you don't like the word God, Fantastic, you know, I'll put your own image in there. A lot of people use universe, some use spirit, some use the all. You know, some may even use the quantum field. I don't know. But but just put whatever you want in there. So there is one source of all things in this universe. Just one and nothing else. And then because there is only that one, then the next logical conclusion is what? If there's only one then you must be an aspect of that one, correct? Yes. And if you're an aspect of that one and you've been given this mind which is powerful, then you can actually use your oneness 
to bring about into your life the things that you want. And you do this through your belief, your thought plus feeling. Some people have probably gone one step beyond this. You know, in, in the movie, the, uh, the Secret, who said the movie The Secret? How am I doing on time? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> in the movie The Secret, and I, I, it's long, it's been a while since I saw it, so I can't remember exactly. Somebody sit there, sitting there, and he's thinking, and he's humming, and then all of a sudden this elephant appears, right? Do you, you remember this? I vaguely remember it. So the inference is that all you have to do is sit and think and feel, and then things will magically appear. Well, in the, in the ultimate sense, that's true. Now, Bob Proctor, my mentor, was actually in that movie, and when people quizzed him about that, he said, well, of course, in real life, it's not that simple because we're not that powerful. So we actually have to do something. You know, the Quakers call it pray and move your feet, right? So in other words, oftentimes we, we put something into universal consciousness and then our job is to watch for the signs that are coming. There is actually a part of our physical being which helps us do that and it's called the RAS, the Reticular Activating System. Just think RAS for short. And it's down here at the base of your brain and guess what it does? It lets in information that it thinks is important to you. A couple of examples. If you want, you decide you want to buy a red car, and your current one is, well, Barbara doesn't like gray, so she says, no, I don't like this gray, but we're going to get a red one. Guess what happens? You start seeing red vans everywhere, right? When people start thinking about having babies or they're about to have a baby, guess what happens? They start seeing things related to babies everywhere. It's just the way of the world. And it's this RAS that does it. And it's part of our whole system. So in other words, when you start thinking and feeling deeply, yes, you can bring things in instantaneously, but more often than not, there are steps that are going to appear that you have to take to get it. So if you want to get a new house, for instance, and you've got this image of the house that you want, then if you're careful, you will start seeing signs leading you to ways that you can move towards getting this new house. So that, that's, that's really the crux of the whole matter. So just like when you're on the subway, when, when, you, when you get on the train, you have to stay on the train. In other words, that's your release. You're releasing the platform, you're releasing what's come behind, and your thoughts and your feelings are with the law moving towards what you want. And of course, if you're like me and you're getting to your destination a lot faster, you'll be grateful. So in a nutshell, those are the, the, the steps of spiritual mind treatment. I know you've all heard it before, but it really doesn't do any harm to remember it again. And I kind of like the analogy of the tube because when I thought of chasm, I thought of gap, I thought of mind the gap, and then I thought, gee, I can use this for a talk. And somebody's telling me if I don't, actually nobody is, but if I don't start wrapping up soon, I'm going to keep you here forever. Oh, I remember, usually my talks are pretty short. They're shorter than this one. But one Wednesday, I had decided that I looked around the room and I saw all of these, um, whatever we call them. Yeah, banner, the banners of uh, all the different religions. And I decided to do a talk on world religions. Well, and in case you've never noticed, when you come in here, Reverend Jesse did this deliberately. I need some water before it's gone. When you walk in here, because most people come in through Christianity, not everybody, but most people, you actually walk in through two crosses. There's a Western cross here. And there's an Eastern cross over here. So you walk in through different crosses. So I decided to give this talk. Bottom line is, it went on forever. And then I think Barbara, somebody actually suggested I shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Which I eventually did. So where does all this lead us? It leads us to this. We need to live a life of awareness. Why? Because these thoughts and feelings 
are not just what we're putting in on good stuff. There's so much crud in here, and <laughs> you're all old enough to have this. There's so much crud in here, all these old tapes running, that they're actually, when you attach feelings to them, when we do, and we do it subconsciously, they're starting to bring things in that we don't want. And that's oftentimes why we get repetitions of things that we don't want, because it's these old programs. So when we practice spiritual mind treatment, what are we doing is, we're replacing these old programs with new programs which override them. Which leads me to my final point, and it's this. It's what G Jesus said, pray always. Another way of interpreting that is, live in awareness. When you live in awareness, you have the capability to control your own life. When you see stuff coming in your mind that you don't like, you can replace it. So the key, I think, to the whole of life, whether it's science of mind or not, is to live in awareness. And there was actually a quote from Eckhart Tolle today in my meditation app, and I forgot it, but it was about living in awareness. So let's just know together that there is, there is one life, and that life I choose to call God. And that life is in and through me, it's in and through each and every person in this room. It's in and through every person of this planet. It's in everything. And because I know this, and because I'm one with it, I'm able to claim now the thing that is most pressing on my mind, and this is peace in our world. I'm able to claim that the forces of good are coming together within each and every person, and that we, as we more and more focus on this we reach a critical mass and when we reach that critical mass i am knowing that peace becomes the dominant thought in human minds that peace and love and kindness are flowing through each and every person and i claim it for each and every person in this room i claim it for myself and i claim it for each and every person on this earth and it is with joy with love with gratitude that I release my word into this divine law which always, always, always says yes. And so it is. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for being here yet again. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your support. And that goes for everyone online as well. We really appreciate everything that you give to this center your time your energy your presence and most especially your monetary donations it is because of what you donate to us that we can be here providing for you so thank you for everything you give to us and i invite you now to say with me divine love through me blesses and multiplies all the good i am and have all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now, and so it is. Uh, David, David said a line that has given me an idea for a talk. The next time Jesse relinquishes the stage, because he doesn't do it often. It, 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 it is high praise when he taps you and goes, okay, I'm going to be gone this weekend. You're going to do it. And you're like, oh. Uh, when he was talking about the London transportation, and he said, well, if you don't get off too often, you'll get where you're going pretty quickly. And I just went, you know what? There's a talk right there. Because how many times do we get on that train or that bus or in that taxi and then get off? And then we waste time because we're, why did we get off? So I'm like, you know what? I think there's a talk in there. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you, David. I may or may not remember to credit you then. I did put in my notes that it was from a talk you gave. So. Yes. Yes, you will. You'll talk back to me because that's what we do here, right? It's one of my favorite things about this is we are very interactive. All right. Um, and, the, and my brain just shorted out, so we're going to see what we're going to treat for because I have no idea. I'm just going to open my mouth and see. But I'm going to invite you into that consciously sacred space. Because the truth is, it's all sacred. It's all sacred all the time. 
what we want to do is be consciously aware of that. Yes, it is thoughts. Yes, it is feelings. But he's right. The big piece is awareness. So I'm, I'm inviting you into the consciously aware sacred space of knowing that there is one, just one, and that each and every one of us flow out of that one. There is one life, there is one power, there is one presence, there is one love, and that love flows through each of us out into this material world. We live that life. We are that power. We are that presence. As you step into this week, I invite you to be consciously aware. In those times when you think you don't have the power, you do. In those times when you think the love is running a little low, I invite you to turn up the faucet. You are plugged into an infinite source, an infinite source of whatever it is that you need. It is always flowing to you. The invitation is for you to consciously accept it. To be consciously aware. There is nowhere that God is not. That that chasm that we talked about is merely in your mind. Step across. Step across in awareness in consciousness and know whatever it is that you are seeking is seeking you. So I invite you to drink plenty of water this week, stay hydrated, stay cool, and stay you. The best part of you. And I relax into gratitude, grateful for a teaching that teaches me who I am, grateful for a teaching that teaches me the source of me, that teaches me the source of each and every one of you. It's all the same source. And I'm grateful for a place to come to a community that supports that. I'm grateful for our ministers, our practitioners, our musicians, I am grateful for each and every one of you. I am grateful for the technology. I am grateful for Reverend David to stepping into the gap. While Jesse takes a, a, a deserved day off. And I'm grateful just because grateful is another word for love. And I relax and release into law with love. And so it is. So with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. Something wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I choose it. I trust it. I trust it. I use it. I use it. I love it. And so it is.